games that we've been running for the best part of a year now, I believe. So um, I am now going to hand over to my dear friend and colleague, so don't sit down, Chris, um, Chris Harwood, who is um, Associate Director of Professional Development at the GSA. He has been the architect of all of our um, training and qualifications um, and, um, and knows a thing or two about agile sourcing because he's been training on the subject. So without further ado, over to you, Chris. Ah. I went to a conference and somebody said, isn't it great when you get an applause before you actually say anything? And I said, yeah, that's actually usually quite good, particularly if you get the applause before. It's if you don't get it at the end, that's a bit of a worry, isn't it? So, uh, so it's lovely to see you all anyway. Um, so my role in this particular session um, is really to introduce people that know actually very much more about Agile sourcing than, uh, than perhaps I do. I have lots of views. I have lots of opinions about Agile sourcing and how it all works. But um, let me um, invite to the stage uh, Hemen Puthli, who is Managing Director of uh, the NEO Group, which is an international consulting firm that have been, uh, that have been around for a good, a good time. And, most importantly, have been involved an awful lot in uh, in delivering agile sourcing projects. So, Hamant, nice to see you, and uh, and also Richard Scott um, is going to join us as well. Uh, Richard Scott is uh, commercial director at uh, the Deal Coach, and again, lots and lots of experience of um, lots and lots of experience of consulting, generally speaking, but also the agile piece. So, uh, gentlemen, I'll leave it to you to um, to set some foundations. Can you can you see the screen and us? Oh we are seeing it here. Oh you're seeing it there. Okay good. Alright. Let's have the first slide then. Click on the oh, okay. oh I can do the yeah. Uh, Super uh, very good. Yeah, so uh, three very quick uh, points on our agenda. One is just talk a little bit about what agile sourcing is, the method, the framework, uh, and to talk about how do you assess whether a particular initiative or a, uh, an instance of uh, running a, a procurement uh, is uh, ready for agile or it isn't. And we will also walk you through a use case we want to allow a lot of time for question and answer, so this is going to be really quick. Uh, I'm going to run through the slides very fast. Stop us any, at any time if you have a question that way, or we will just uh, take the questions when we finish a particular um, item on the agenda. So without further ado, everybody here, I'm guessing, is familiar with the uh, <coughs> traditional approach to run an RFP or a, or a tender, which is typically you start with a very clear statement of requirement, and it runs along what in the software engineering industry has been called the waterfall method. And the, the key feature here is that it is unidirectional. Uh, it just goes forward in one direction, doesn't come back to the previous step, uh, and it's linear. So it, one thing leads to another, it leads to another, and so on and so forth. The focus here is on standardization. Uh, the requirements are pretty clearly laid out. Bidders have to comply with the requirement or not, or if they take exception, they have to specify and justify why that exception has been taken, and so on and so forth. Innovation and improvisation around what has been asked for is not at all encouraged, because otherwise you, the fear is that you'd be comparing apples with oranges, which typically in a PSU environment, in a tendering situation, uh, it becomes a little tricky, because then you can't justify why you selected one over the other. if the if the value proposition is itself different. So that's uh, where we came from. And now, uh, increasingly, the world has moved, uh, but not, all, not all, uh, in all situations, uh, has moved towards the agile way of doing things. Again, drawing from the software engineering industry uh, and practices, waterfall gave way to agile uh, software development. And what are the key features of Agile? They're basically, first of all, it's focused around the end customer. It places the end customer at the center of the process. Uh, traditionally, you had procurement on the buy side, the procurement function, and 
on the sell side, it was a sales function. So the procurement folks and the sales folks were the ones who were doing most of the interacting. But in Agile, the, the end customer, the, the user of the service, uh, is really uh, key to uh, the whole process. And on the other side, the, the technical people, the SMEs, the subject matter experts, the architects, the designers uh, on the supply side are the ones engaged in conversations with the technical, their, their counterparts on the buy side. The focus moves from procurement and sales engagement to technical engagement on, on both. That's one. The other is it is collaborative, intensively collaborative. Uh, there, there are um, numerous working sessions that are set up uh, where these technical teams on both sides discuss what is needed and what is possible. Uh, suppliers share their experiences with, with other clients. Uh, that gives you know, brighter ideas to the, to the buyers and say, hey, if that's possible, then maybe we should re-articulate our requirement uh, a little differently. Uh, and it's iterative. So from unidirectional linear processes, you come to circular, collaborative, iterative processes focused around the customer. That's the key difference. And uh, one of the advantages of this as a more of a, of a byproduct is that it uh, brings out the, the, the chemistry between the teams on both sides of the uh, procurement process, you know, the, the buyers and the sellers. So uh, it's a hidden advantage, but it's uh, highly uh, something that you can leverage. Um, you know, if you have three or four different suppliers, you know, who does your team get along best with? It, it just becomes obvious at the end of this collaborative and iterative process. Can I just, can I just come in with a point? Yeah, sure. So there's a um, very, very good introduction. Just adding and, and complementing to that. I, I, I think the key thing is to, that I would mention at this point is this is not an easy option. Right? So there is a lot to be said for the linear waterfall model, uh, particularly where you, you end up with a re repeat purchases or a sort of arm's length relationship. This is very intensive. Okay, both parties, buy side, sell side, will need very strong collaboration, engagement skills, uh, particularly on the client side, will need very strong levels of sort of cl senior client uh, stakeholder buy into this process because you go into this possibly thinking you might come out with solution X. But in fact, the, the expectation from both parties is you might come out with solution Y. And that's a good thing. You, you should be expecting that. And not every team on the buy side and the sell side is going to have the maturity and the collaboration skills or even the stakeholder support to go through that journey. So just, just want to make that this key point here about that this is a, it's not a soft option at all. Actually, far from it. It's a very intensive, demanding process. Question? Yeah, just a question. Sure. Um, do you, do you typically have already chosen your supplier before you do the agile process or are you running the cycle? I, I think you can do both. I mean, I've personally been part of a, a process which was, uh, I was on the sell side at the time at Accenture, working for a well-known sort of global mining clients uh, and we were being bid against a, another well-known service provider. Now, I have to say that we found this was 2009. I know things have moved on a little bit, but I think all parties, particularly the two providers, I'm still actually friends now with my counterpart, Solution Architect, on, on the competition. It was actually very stressful, right? particularly around things like IP. Right? It's one thing sort of you know, going out for a drink with someone, but actually when you're literally making your proposals and showing your ways of working in front of your, your closest competitor to the market, that, that's actually quite stressful. And I think the client possibly didn't behave all the time in a particularly mature or responsible fashion, a little bit blasé about some of the, the anxieties on, on the vendor side. They sort of um, didn't address those. I think that on the other side, though, I think certainly if you've got a, a potentially an existing partner, and again, I've been involved in relationships in different industries where there's need, you know, there is no other partner. You're kind of stuck with each other, but you have a problem to solve, then this with the right level of commitment and facilitation can be applicable as well. Yeah, we call that sole sourcing, which is basically you have one provider, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be competitive bidding, if that was the root of the question. Chris. Yeah, Richard, I was interested. It, said, it sounded to me as though you had a scenario where you had both suppliers talking to the client at the same time. Is that something that you would see as being uh, common, typical? Uh, well, I, well, I will, I will, you know, I'll be a very humble person. I, I, I wouldn't claim that that is that is uh, best practice or common practice. It does happen, and there are some 
clients who get it in their heads, maybe they've attended a certain conference or they're listening to certain advisors that think that is a good idea. Yeah. It can be done, I've seen it done. I think the byproduct of, uh, of that process, as I've tried to lay out, is actually puts a lot of stress on the vendors and actually mm. question for the client, is that in your interest? Do you yes. really want to do that? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I think what you're referring to is what uh, has been called the big room uh, approach, right? You basically get all the, all the vendors, two, three, four, in one big room, and the buyer stands there, and then they kind of brainstorm, if you like, the uh, the, uh, the solution together. And I I agree uh, with you completely there. It, this may not yield the best outcome for the buyer because what you're setting up really is uh, uh, an arena for competitive, you know, jostling between service providers. So the focus f moves away from the technical solution to who can. Who's the louder voice in the, in the room, so to speak? Uh, you know, who's more forceful, who's more articulate, uh, and, and things like that. So that's not necessarily the outcome that we want. So we, we in, in your group, what we have been using is the multiple room, to borrow the same metaphor, multiple rooms. So it's, it's kind of like, a, imagine a hotel room like this. There are multiple rooms, and suppliers are in each of those rooms. You know, if there are, let's say, three or four. Uh, in each of the rooms, and the, the teams go have one brainstorming here, another one there, another one there. And they're continuously carrying the thought process that has been, uh, you know, evolved with the previous conversation. So there's a lot of cross pollination that happens across this whole thing, and and uh, the buyer is en enriched with with all that information. Yeah. 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 Should we move on to the next slide. Any more questions on on till here? Yeah, so uh, sometimes it's, this gets confused with, uh, you know, just as in the old days, before Agile, we used to do something called RAGJAD, it was rapid applications development, joint applications development, prototyping, basically. And some people thought it was like an anything goes approach. You know, just, just start seat of your pants solution, just sit down, start coding, and you're done. It's not that. It's, uh, it's, it's, this is a structured process. Flexibility doesn't mean that, you know, anything goes. Uh, there are certain well-defined principles at, at play here. Uh, it is iterative. There is this freedom to innovate. Uh, but what we are not trying to do is have the tail wag the dog, which sometimes this gets confused uh, with, which is basically, oh, the suppliers are telling me what to do. So no, it's not that. They're helping you shape the requirement in, in a manner that is more uh, a benchmark closer to what the, the state of the art is in the market today, which some buyers are sometimes not fully aware of. Um, and yes, it, comparing apples to oranges is, is, is a valid criticism, but then you don't know whether you needed an apple or an orange before you started this process. Uh, you, need, you knew you needed a fruit, right? So uh, depending on what comes back as a response, you could pick an apple at a certain price or an orange at a certain price. So. That's effectively what, what happens, which I think is a good segue to the next slide, which is the... Yeah. Can, can I just pick up on one point? Absolutely. I think the... Um, I'll just highlight two points here. One is that I think the need for very strong facilitation, because one of the dangers is, is, is of getting a lot of highly engaged, motivated people in the room is that they will never stop talking, <laughs> and you'll actually never get to the result. So the role of the facilitator to say, to right, enough already. I think you know, at this stage, we've got the solution that's good enough. Let's move on. Yeah. That's really, really important. So very strong, sort of trusted, high integrity f facilitation. But I think the other thing that comes out for me in, in some of the projects that I've done is this, is this point about cultural compatibility, mm -hmm. right? Because I think there is something on the client side. Who, they, they should be thinking, right, okay, these, I get the proposal, but actually a real test of this relationship is, right, do I want to be on a red flag call with this person at three o'clock in the morning right. when my go live has failed? Right, smart clients will be asking themselves that question. This is actually a great way of helping you sort of get to that. You're seeing people under a little bit of stress, a little bit of pressure, you know, a little bit out of their comfort zone. You, you'll, re you'll get the sort of the real feel of the metal and the personality of the character of the teams that you'll be working Absolutely, with. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the points we had there. Okay, so uh, not all projects, not all procurement initiatives are agile ready, so to speak, or, or even warrant an agile approach. It's not a silver bullet. It's not a panacea for all uh, all ailments, for sure. Some uh, in some cases, you may want to stick with traditional sourcing, the waterfall approach. 
So what are those cases? So we, this is a very brief lift of about, uh, list of about six criteria. First of all, your executives on the buy side, they need to buy into the fact that you're going to be running an agile sourcing process and understand what that process is and what it involves. Uh, you, know, you, you know, if you are required by regulatory uh, or, or internal policy uh, you know, imperatives to, to follow a certain rigid, formal process, then again, uh, there's no point even discussing whether Agile is right for you. Uh, client and uh, supplier stakeholders on both sides need to have a collaborative mindset because the amount of time stakeholders are going to invest in this process is quite a lot. You're basically front-loading everything that could potentially happen between the buyer technical people and the seller technical people further downstream, probably after the contract when it's too late, right? You're, you're front-loading that uh, into the uh, assessment and evaluation process itself. So the stakeholders need to be there. Uh, they need to be uh, uh, you know, put in time to articulate what they believe they want, listen to what the supplier says is possible, and then work out something, and then rinse repeat with the next supplier. That's, again, a, a critical success factor. Um, again, it, it's, it's useful where services are not commodified and standardized. If, it's, if you're in a, a commodities market, if you're just buying uh, fairly regular stuff, uh, which can be you know, in a perfect market, made available by just about any supplier with hardly any differentiation, you probably don't need agile sourcing. Um, agile sourcing is, is very relevant in situations where the technology is new, emerging, cutting edge, leading edge, bleeding edge, whatever you want to call it, like Gen AI or something, which the buyer doesn't fully understand, but has a sense that we require something that looks like this. But suppliers have a better understanding of that, and they are able to engage with the buyer. Those are better suited rather than commod commoditized uh, propositions on, on either side. And innovation is key. So collaboration, iteration, innovation, customer at the center of the process, these are certain principles that agile sourcing brings with it, which is not in the traditional sourcing. Yep, very good. So, so I think a couple of things I, I would add to this. I mean, I think, you know, just, um, just remember, you're not just working on the solution. So this should not be agile solutioning, although that's a very important part of the process. What is the technology, the process, the delivery locations, uh, uh, and so on. Make time in this process for agile pricing and business case development, right? So what is this thing going to cost? One-time costs, ongoing costs, what are the investments, what do the cash flows look like? And that business case, of course, has to stack up for both parties over time. And make sure you understand where the risk lies. And then the, the final item is agile contracting, right? You must have yeah. commercially proficient people who can rapidly take, right, I get what the slides say, right, I can now build within days, not week, a statement of work, an implementation mm -hmm. plan, a charges schedule, service level methodology, and so on. Um, and this probably is a good example of where it's probably a good idea if you've already got an existing relationship because you probably have a relevant master services agreement or re ready to go so you don't have a sort of a, a four-month punch-up with DLA Piper on warranties and indemnities and data protection and stuff like that okay so just remember those three dimensions your solution business case contract all need to come out of this process yes thanks for bringing that up actually what one of the things we do in your group is that we make a list of we, we can create a term sheet from the client side which essentially are the, the skeleton, the barebone framework of what the MSA would look like, uh, the must-haves and the, and the optionals. And then that is circulated around the same time as the RFP or the requirements statement. So the, the procurement and legal people can go off and have their own collaborative sessions on what the terms, uh, you know, co-evolve the terms matrix, if you like, uh, side by side with the as opposed to sequencing it and putting it after the technical solution has been debated, and then you get to the legal part. So thank you for bringing that up. It's a very valid point. Any questions on, on these couple of slides? Did you want okay. to move on to these cases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the person who should be presenting this is not here. Uh, this is a researcher from Cambridge. Uh, and they had uh, worked on, uh, <coughs> together with his professors, uh, Nikolai had worked with uh, his professors here to uh, study academically a couple of use cases. This is an example of, of Finnair, 
where uh, there's a lot of text here. Uh, this is from an academic paper. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, I had to persuade him to put some colors in these boxes so to make it <laughs> a little less black and white. Uh, but yes, if you, if you go through some, I'll just highlight some of these points here. Uh, it's one of those typical, you know, the terminologies in Agile are things like fail fast, etc. So uh, <clears throat> those are the principles followed. So they needed an app, FinAir needed an app, and they uh, engaged with a bunch of uh, providers. They had a long list, uh, presented user stories to them, created a short list. And this is important, it's what we're talking about. Selection criteria are the design principle, ways of working, culture, collaboration, and flexibility. Just exactly what we talked about uh, in the earlier slides. So this is really what makes it successful. Um, So they did two first sprints with some gamification in it that took about six weeks, and then, then <clears throat> moved to supplier selection and contracting. By it's typically a funnel. You start with a long list, then you know down select uh, to a short list, and then come come down to two, and then start negotiating with them uh, and contracting with them the financial and the and the uh, commercial terms, um, legal terms, and then finally sign up with with one. So this is the use case. <coughs> And uh, yeah. Well, yeah, happy, happy to take questions. My observation would be that sounds like a very expensive process for the venue, and if I'm looking at that opportunity as a provider of technology, I'd be saying six weeks of gamification of one of my best resources, one of my experts, um, to get to potentially someone else's. Yes, it, it could be, yeah, it, it would, like, like we've been saying right through, the investment on both sides in this process is uh, quite intensive um, in terms of, of time and effort. Have you seen any examples where that gets mitigated by the buyer? You know, effectively saying, I'll cover your costs of doing this exercise, even if you're more successful? We haven't seen that, but it's not impossible. The, the key in agile sourcing is that it's, op it's an open and flexible, it's not a rigid methodology. It doesn't, there is no, you can't do this or you can't do that in agile. Just as an agile software development, you know, it's, it's whatever is, works best for the, the end customer, which is basically the buyer, the technical buyer. So <clears throat> this is not about getting to results quickly as much as it is about getting to the right results quickly. <coughs> you know, just what we were talking about earlier, in coffee break, Chris. Do you want to jump in and? Yeah, <coughs> I mean, I, I, I agree with that, but it, it's, it's We've seen these headlines over the last few years about the RFP being dead. You know, the RFP is dead and agile sourcing is what it's all about. Um, I think the reality... Oh, thank you. Um, the reality is that the RFP is still alive and, you know, and, and very popular amongst lots of organisations. Some of it is because it can be quite an efficient way of, of resource being used. Um, so we need to be really careful about choosing the right um, the right procurement, um, the, the right um, products or services to use Agile. Um, I, mean, I was involved in one fairly recently, um, and one of the advantages, this was a, an AMS um, service, so you know, it was a reasonable size, um, global organization, and what the buyer said was that this was a great way a really good way of avoiding the backwards and forwards that can sometimes go on for months around contractual aspects, around you know, the this, this, this small detail that you can actually thrash out, providing that both parties actually commit to those, um, you know, those workshops. So if you find the right service that justifies the time of the, of the supplier, for sure, and also the time of the buyer as well, which I think Richard was was your point. I think this is a really good question about the um, investment. Uh, of, uh, I, 
having worked on both the client and the and the provider side in my career, I have to say I've seen a lot of examples of, of abuse of vendors by by clients in in terms of very disrespectful behaviour. I remember at Accenture uh, being briefed by a well-known Dutch uh, dairy products firm who is issuing an RFP for finance and procurement services a week before Christmas. The <laughs> deadline was the, for the response was end of January, and this guy literally laughed at us and the other vendors in the room. I mean, so I mean, I've seen some dreadful, dreadful buy-side behavior. And I think if you get into this process, you have to be very respectful of the investment required from both parties. To your point, <coughs> typically non-chargeable, highly skilled, uh, scarce resources who yep. you could probably deploy on five or six opportunities you need to qualify this very carefully and I think one of the challenges for the client here is this suddenly becomes very bit risky a little bit out of control and actually it fails they qualify out well it's, it's quite interesting I'd like your business but actually I don't understand this agile thing so I think you, the, the client has got to put some boundaries around this in terms of bounding the investment from the provider otherwise the client does risk a, 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 um, a negative qualification decision from the client yes please Okay. There's two points I was going to make. I mean, the first one was about respect for the participants. Yep. Whether you're running an RFP or an agile event, respect for the participants is absolutely key, so you can't drag them through an expensive process. Um, but also, as a buyer, you need to do a significant amount of homework before one of these. So I've been in an event like this that was run by one of the big consultancies, and they were trying to build this supply chain to go from reinsurers to insurers to fintechs and drag them all through a, a similar process, prototyping, etc. when actually we should have taken a step back and said, you know what, that reinsurer only works with these two insurers who only work with those four fintechs. And we should have chosen via the supply chain so that, so that we could have saved everybody lots of time and expense by being a lot more aware of our market before we launched into it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, where I work now, we've been doing agile sourcing for quite a long time, and the people that talk about the big room events and so on talk about do a complex RFP in three days. It's never three days. It's months and months of effort to lead to three intense absolutely, days. Yeah. And, and that homework on the buy side is absolutely critical because without that, mm. You know, the magic just isn't there in the agile. The, the other, the other use cases. I mean, let's 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 not forget. Let's not pretend that the the contract the, the relationship ends at contract signature, right? And, and I think what I would um, invite you to consider is this in terms of strategic renewals. So if you have an existing relationship where there's a lot lot of lock in in both sides, I clearly the client could go out to RFP and so on. That's always a valid option. But in many cases, for many services. The, the client is working with the right vendor, even if there's not a lock-in. It's probably the right vendor to be working with. It's just there's a challenge with the solution and the economics, maybe the relationship. And maybe this is a, uh, a methodology that you can use for strategic renewals, actually you know, sort of transforming the solution relationship that actually benefits both parties because they are committed already. The client benefits because they avoid the huge expense of going to an RFP, which let's not, not forget could cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for the client. And then also um, benefits the provider through at least you know a, a decent fair shot at producing a bespoke solution using the insight that they've gained from the relationship but actually using this methodology to come up with something that an RFP potentially couldn't so this could be a post-contract strategic renewal yeah. strategy as well so just to add to your point I think we have we're short of time but uh, uh, that's the reason why we need to see this in in the through the lens of sustainable sourcing because that's where the value system for of respect uh, of you know of, of each other's uh, time investment uh, cost to your point you know uh, how much uh, the, the vendor is putting in uh, etc becomes important so we are discussing agile sourcing within that framework we, you know it's it's part of the one of the pillars of sustainable sourcing so if you bring those principles in i think you know a lot of those uh, issues would get addressed as well. So thank you. We, we'll, of course, we're around to take questions offline uh, through the day. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, so this is the work of the GSA's Agile Sourcing Working Group. Um, we do have members of buy, advisor, and service provider side, uh, and also buyers on both the public and the private